can you share with us how this documentary came about, like the process for you, Julie, and, and getting this project? Yeah, so back in 2016, uh, I stumbled on the YouTube videos of Mark Balmer. He was walking barefoot across the country to protest climate change and filming himself, you know, walking barefoot every day. And he was really funny and inspiring. You know, the New Yorker likened him to Andy Kaufman. He's got that kind of like absurdist sense of humor. And he really brought a different perspective to the issue of climate change and protecting the planet. And I just kind of really latched onto that as a fan. Uh, I never got to meet him in person, I uh, just kind of followed his journey and was really devastated when he was killed on this walk. Uh, and it was, you know, the day after Trump was inaugurated when, when Mark was uh, struck and killed on the walk, just happened to be that way. And uh, I reached out to his family and said, you know, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Maybe I could help to commemorate Mark's life and tell his biography through a feature length film. And, and uh, that's kind of what ended up happening. Wow. Well, when you got the call, Jim, what were you thinking when you heard Julie call you and say about wanting to do this for your son? What were, you, what were your first thoughts? Well, we had heard about Julie from a colleague of Mark's uh, at Brown who had done an MFA. They had been undergraduates. So Julie was an undergraduate of this particular, had gone to school and done her undergraduate, right? With, with uh, yeah. So, you know, we had a, a, an introduction uh, and then Julie had set up a phone call with both Mary and I, my wife, and uh, Mark's mom. And, you know, it went really well. I mean, you know, I mean, that was late February and Mark was killed in, in late January. So, you know, it was still really raw, but at the time we had already had a number of filmmakers reach out to us and, you know, we really had to start thinking about it. And, and obviously Mark was somebody who was filming himself and, 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 you know, I mean, Mark really wanted people to know about what he was doing. So, we felt in, in order to honor his life and his legacy, uh, we wanted to work with a filmmaker if we could. Uh, and it just so happened that, that Julie came along and, and Julie really was the perfect person to tell Mark's story because of her, you know, her, her, her background, mm -hmm. her understanding of social justice, the other films that she had done. And then obviously, you know, the phone call went really well. Mary and I got off the phone call and felt that, that, that Julie was very warm and, 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 you know, I mean, it wasn't like she was pushing her way into our lives. I mean, we were open to it. Uh, and then, you know, we had talked about possibly setting something up in the future and that's ulti and ultimately what happened. So. Well, you know, it's important that you get the right person. I mean, to represent your son, I mean, it's a very, you know, sensitive issue and it's, it's your child. So making sure that someone understands that is really important. And Julie, I have to say you did a marvelous job. When you started the process of putting it together, what were some of the logistics that you had to deal with in terms of, you know, you had his um, videos, but then you had all the other little pieces because it was really well done. So can you share with us a little bit about that? Absolutely, yeah. This is the first documentary I ever made about someone who was deceased. And, uh, you know, it's difficult emotionally to never get to meet the person you're profiling. Um, but I got to know Mark through his 500 YouTube videos on his channel that he put up there over a decade. Uh, he had 100 videos representing the 100 days that he was on the barefoot walk. And so I had all these hours and hours of, of footage from Mark, him filming himself. You know, Jim and Mary had home videos of him growing up. Um, and then as far as picking who to interview, you know, we just kind of wanted the people who were closest to Mark in his life to, uh, we wanted to get really intimate in the interviews with them instead of interviewing, you know, a hundred people, let's interview eight people who really meant the world to Mark. So. Uh, Jim and Mary, his parents, uh, were just really generous in giving us a lot of access to their emotions and thoughts going through, you know, telling his life story and, and sharing their grief um, over his loss. We talked to Mark's girlfriend, Ada, um, who's a really powerful presence in the film. And, you know, Mark was on this walk raising money for an activist group in the Providence, Rhode Island area uh, called FANG, Fighting Against Natural Gas. And so we interviewed them. Um, so, you know, another thing about the film, we really wanted to focus on Mark's life rather than his death. And so we hope the film lets you kind of chronologically go through his journey from him leaving his house, 
uh, saying goodbye house, you know, walking barefoot and, and walking over 700 miles over the course of the journey barefoot. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, um, when I was watching a documentary, Jim, and you had all these amazing images of, you know, Marek as a kid and talking about his passion and how he loved to dress up and all these weird things. It's just magical for me because I think uh, creating memories for our children are so important. And what I have to say about you guys, you created memories that will always be there, you know, what you did for him. And I think that's brilliant. So you mentioned the part when he was younger and he loved to dress up in all these quirky little costumes. Can you share with us about that whole experience with him doing that? I thought it was so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Mary and I both were, you know, he was an only child. And so he got a lot of our attention. Uh, you know, there were things around the house. I mean, when we were first married, particularly when we were living in Indiana, where Mark was born, I mean, it was a struggle financially, but Mary would pick up stuff at, you know, yard sales and different places. So there were hats and different things. And I don't know, he just had a penchant for sort of wanting to dress up and, and, and be kind of goofy, even when he was probably two and a half or three, you know, you know, he'd have like goggles on and a cowboy hat or, you know, different things. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I mean, I think that was the start of it, you know, as he got older, uh, you know, he had some interest in film and making when he was in high school, him and his buddy Brent would go out and um, film stuff. They had like, mm -hmm. he had like a briefcase, uh, who knows what was in Mark's briefcase, <laughs> but, and then one time, you know, he dressed up in a gorilla suit and went into a local theater and kind of picked up a trash can and started waving it around. And I guess the uh, theater people called the police because the way that Mary found out about it is uh, they were at the gym together and Mark had an interest in picking up the local um, free paper that came out every week and wanted to look at the police blotter because he wanted to see if he was in the police blotter, which he was, so. <laughs> when did you see the spark of this activism starting in him? At what point did you recognize that? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it, there were things in high school where he would get interested in different things, but I don't really think it really began to really, uh, that spark really didn't happen until probably after he left Wheaton where he did his undergraduate and he was working uh, one summer as an intern at this uh, kind of waste management company and he was cataloging all of their newsletters and the newsletters were all around, you know, recycling and waste and Mark, was really kind of struck by just how much plastic was being dumped into the ocean. And so he really got energized around eliminating plastic from his life and packaging and different things like that. So that was kind of the beginning. And then from there, you know, I think the whole climate change issue was, was something that he recognized. It was really an important aspect uh, and, and, and maybe, you know, the existential issue of our time. He believed that. And then, he also, you know, he became a plant-based vegan. Uh, he felt as though that was the best way to, you know, minimize his carbon footprint. Uh, he had a car at one point, got rid of that. So he, when he was in Providence, he, he only used basically foot power or bicycle power and occasionally public transportation to get around. And so, you know, he was somebody who really, you know, not just talked about the issue of climate change, but was looking for ways in his own life to minimize his, 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 his carbon footprint. And then, you know, right before he left, uh, he had arranged to have uh, solar panels installed on the house that he owned uh, where his housemates were living. And unfortunately he never got back to see the, the, the solar panels that were installed, so. I was talking about this the other day with someone about how we don't take care of the planet as humans, you know? We're on this beautiful planet that is given to us and we just don't see that this is a living, breathing thing and we don't take care of it. So, and I especially love that, you know, at the end when he <laughs> talked about, and I literally was just saying the exact same thing to someone. I said, we have to make our heaven right here. This is where we are. And then at the end of Dr. Lee says that, and I was like about to bawl out in tears because I was like, that is just what I said a few days ago to someone. This is paradise. This is all we have, all we know. So I only want to say again, guys, thank you so much for this documentary. It's so important, especially now. But, and my question to Julie, um, you know, obviously you had to go back and forth with the parents. How much interaction did you have, of course, with the parents in terms of checking in what they felt about this section, what this needs to be in? Tell me a little bit about that journey between how both of you progressed the documentary. Yeah, you know, 
Jim and Mary were incredible collaborators and really understood their son's journey and reasons for doing it and were close to him so they could really narrate the day by day journey of walking barefoot across the country. You know, um, and we built a, a great friendship built on trust and, and they saw my previous films and knew that I have a social justice, you know, activist piece to what I do. And, and uh, so I, I appreciated that they trusted me to, you know, direct and edit this film. And, you know, they did not micromanage me, you know, as a, as a filmmaker, you, you sit down and you edit and you can't let all the subjects come in the room with you. You know, you kind of have to bring a finished piece to them and say, this is what we made, you know, and, and I hope you like it. I hope you accept it. And I was just very lucky that they, they did at the end of the day, um, you know, some difficult territory to navigate was just kind of like how much of the current events political moment do we include in the film? You know, because Mark was walking in 2016 during election season, noticing Trump signs on the landscape mm -hmm. as he's walking through Pennsylvania. And he was kind of, you know, forced to comment on the issue in a sense, just because that's what was going on. So, you know, he was in a hotel room nursing his bare feet after walking, you know, on election night and taking in the results that Trump won and being shocked just as much, you know, many of us were. But also he had that extra insight of being in these rural areas where he noticed that, okay, maybe Trump is more popular than some of us thought. Um, so, so that was difficult to kind of just navigate that, but I, I'm glad that the film now is kind of this time capsule. And I think it's really relevant as we're in election season 2020 mm -hmm. to get this recap of what was going on through the film in 2015 and 2016 and early 2017 as well. Jim, were there things that you felt um, you wanted to stay, keep in there or things that think you maybe should have kept in there but didn't? I mean, I'm sure there was so much material. Did you feel at this point there was something else you could add or anything that you might say, oh my gosh, I wish we had gotten this in about Mark? No, I mean, I, I think both Mary and I are, you know, we watch a lot of movies. We've watched a lot of documentaries. You know, you realize that a documentary is not gonna be much more than 90 minutes. So it's, it is really about editing. And, you know, I, I think because of my interest in the arts anyways, you know, I, I kind of, like Julie said, I mean, we, we did, it wasn't up to us to tell Julie what to do. I mean, she, you know, very skillfully arranged the interviews and, and sort of set up what she felt that, you know, how she wanted to tell the story. I think what was really interesting is, you know, the, the original rough cut that we saw it, it didn't have some of the things that were added uh, to parallel the political events that were happening. And, and looking back, I can honestly say now that it really was genius to do that because Mark's story is a compelling human interest story, but at the same time, it, it speaks to very specific things that are happening in the world. And so I think that adding that really made it a, a film that really speaks much more broadly than just the human interest piece. The human interest piece is great, but um, you know, and, and when we saw what was basically the final cut, I think maybe without the film score, I, I can't remember if we, but anyways, what, whatever Julie sent us to sort of say, okay, this is kind of really close to what we're gonna be presenting at festivals. You know, Mary and I just went through it. I mean, we laughed, we cried. It was, it was very emotional. And then we just looked at each other and said, this is like the perfect film. I mean, I, there was nothing that I, you know, and it's so odd because, you know, I kind of wondered, would we see the film and say, Ooh, I, you know, I wish you hadn't put that in there or, you know, I wish there was this, but the reality is it, it was, it's a beautiful movie. I mean, yeah. if, if I had to sort of script it out and say, you know, I kind of wish Julie could do this, this, and this, I, I don't know if I would have come up with a different film, you know, it's pretty amazing. And I think it really speaks to her as, as a filmmaker and in her, ability to really, I think, get at the, the crux of the issue. And also, I mean, you know, we're very appreciative that when she does interviews like this, she's always on point, on message. You know, we, we really got a, a total package. And I mean, how, I, honestly, I sometimes think, how did we manage to sort of coordinate this with everything that we were feeling emotionally? You know, we were just totally devastated. And yet, you know, this is one of those things that we have that's a, a legacy and lasting that's beautiful and tells Mark's story in a way. I think if he could see it, he would be pleased also. Jim, what did you learn more about yourself doing this, this film, doing this documentary about your son? What did you come away with? Um, 
I don't know. I mean, you know, I, Mark and I had a really good relationship. I think sometimes, you know, adult children, it, it, you know, it can be a, a rocky road, a, a bumpy relationship. I mean, I'm not saying that there weren't times that we didn't, we didn't agree on everything, uh, but we always found a way to, to, to put whatever our differences were aside. And I think that one of the things that I appreciate is, you know, when I watch this film, I see the best really of Mary and I in Mark. You know, we weren't perfect parents. None of us are as parents, but we truly did try to find a space and allow him to have a space where he know he knew he was loved. He knew he had the freedom to explore and figure out who he wanted to be. I, I oftentimes feel like, you know, when you bring a child home, you, you, you spend the next 18 years preparing for them to leave, which is kind of a weird way to think about it. But if you do it right, that's what happens. And Mark was ready to go out on his own and, you know, make choices. And, you know, I mean, I could say, I wish he hadn't gone on this last walk, but we would never have told him he couldn't do it. I mean, he was 32 at the time, but we always supported him and what he was up to. And he always supported us and the things that we cared about and the things that we were involved in. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, I look back and, and, you know, there are a lot of memories, as you say, it, the memories make it hard because, you know, those are the things that, you know, we had him for 30 three years and, and now he's gone and there are 33 years of, of really vivid memories and things that you know I think about every day about him so absolutely lots of love there that's for sure Julie what did you come away with learning about uh, yourself doing uh, this wonderful documentary yeah you know I think one reason I was drawn to help tell Mark's story is that I admire his courage, his fearlessness. You know, I'm a pretty anxious person. I'm kind of like the last person who's going to walk barefoot across the country. And yet there's a part of me that so wishes I could be like Mark. And I think there's like a happy medium. You know, we're not telling people to do an action quite as fearless, unless that's just their natural disposition. Um, but there's something we can draw from, from this story, whether it's you know, taking the issue of the environment personally enough to change some of your dietary habits, maybe take on a little bit more of a vegetarian, you know, diet, maybe put some solar panel panels on your roof, get involved in a local activist group, um, fight for environmental protections as far as legislation goes. You know, there's a lot of manageable things that we can do to make a difference um, if we really start to realize our own power to change things. For each one of you, if there's one thing you want to take away from seeing this documentary, what would that be? I, I think, you know, I, I, because it does really highlight Mark's activism and his passion for Earth, I think we really do have to recognize that, you know, we have to do more. And as Julie says, you know, we don't expect everyone to, to give up their automobile and, and different things like that. But there are there are certainly things that we can do. You know, we had started a foundation, the Mark Bomber Sustainability Fund. It's a 501c3. Uh, we're working, our umbrella is sustainability. So working to try to make a, a difference in terms of, you know, the environment, uh, you know, local sustainability, whether it's farming and supporting local farmers, which we've done, uh, you know, trying to support other marginalized groups. We brought some yoga into uh, a woman's jail, uh, which they normally wouldn't have had that. Uh, yoga isn't just something for, for wealthy, you know, suburban women, but that, you know, it can really help women. Uh, and this was a group of women who were incarcerated. So we work with a yoga studio. And so we're trying to do things like that that are very practical. And I think a lot of what Mark was talking about on his walk were the practical things that we could all do. You know, he wasn't expecting everyone to walk across the country either. Uh, and, you know, he talked about, about, you know, like Julie said, if you could just give up meat one day a week, you know, and, and have add, you know, a vegetarian type, meals to your diet and, and maybe minimize the amount of, you know, meat and other things, you know, so th there are a lot of things that we can all do. So I think that's where I would want people to focus on, you know, kind of Mark's message in this film. Definitely. And you, Julie? Yeah, definitely. I agree fully with what Jim said. And, and also, you know, looking at Mark as a writer, performance artist, filmmaker, and how he brought a new flavor to his activism through the arts. And I think it's maybe gonna be an inspiring film for, for people who you know, are artists and see this, this way that you can take on 
these bigger issues uh, through your work. So I, I hope people get inspiration from that. Well, I think uh, once again, you guys, a uh, brilliant job. I am so happy and thankful for your work, Julie, for Jim allowing us, allowing us to have a piece of your son to share his journey. And I know what I took away from it, which is many, many things. But the one thing I did take away from myself personally is making sure that not just protecting the planet, but loving those around you every day, because you never know when the last day will be. So thank you again so much, guys. Tell everybody how to find it, how to see it. What do they need to do? Yeah, so if you go to barefootdocumentary.com, uh, you can see all the information about the film. It's going to be released on the 27th of October. You can buy it on Amazon and iTunes. You can pre-order it right now. And definitely, you know, find us through the website on Facebook and Twitter because uh, we've got a lot of updates. Well, buy it right now is the most important thing and let people see it, see it, see it, see it. And young people. See it, see it, see it now. Thank you guys so much again and have a wonderful, blessed day. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Appreciate it. Thank you.